Anyway, so I was preparing myself to come on here and give a word. Yeah. Um, today I missed. I don't know about you, but I missed diving into the Word of God. Um, I was trying to fix something for all of us. I don't want to do that now because it's more business than anything. And um, I was just trying to fix something good for us today. Yeah, all the people who love the Lord and just need a booster in life. So all you got to do is step out in faith. And I'm being the the hamster. Let's just say I'm being the hamster, making sure that it's safe before I bring you guys on board. Um, but let's get into the word, all right? Let's get into the word. Um, yesterday we did, what did we do? We did um, fill, up the, fill up the jars, yeah? I had to empty out to fill up. <laughs> I had, I was like, I was all emptied out when I was done. Um, just give me a sec, let me get the, the next, the next scripture. You know, people think it's just social network and, um, oh my god, this is right now. Um, just, you know, something to mess around, whatever, whatever. And, you know, it's not a big deal. I lead all my life to do this. I lead all my life to do his work. And yeah, there's some personal bits in between, but it, you get to see all of me. You get to see who I am and what I go through and how I deal with it. And sometimes I'm far from perfect from it, you know? And I mean, I share everything with you guys because I want you to see that this is a real person. This is how life is really. And yet the fight goes on. Like the word of God must be given. So, um, let me just try and get, um, try and get the scripture verses. If anybody finds it, just like it so I can find it really quickly, okay? Shouldn't be too long. So like I said, I was thinking of everybody on here who are supportive to me, who are not just me, but the word of God. Like they're supportive to me lifting up the word. They're really, they have a desire to, uh, to get out of what they're in and just build up the kingdom up for father so today was my first step for that for all of us i'm being the hamster and i mean who do you know that can take 10 us and make it 10,000 us in four months we're going to talk about that after the sabbath okay not today let me just find my scriptures um okay here we go so this one was he commanded them to fill the jars. You know how that hurt? Like I tell like him everything. Like he's my like best friend for like eight years. He's my second best yeah, he's my best friend. Almost I think mine. I didn't know I lost count. He just mocks mocks me. I already have, like, almost no support. It's hard. It's, 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 some days I just feel like throwing in the towel and saying, Father, just take me home now. Because it's just hard. But I push on and I push and I push. And he, he gives me the strength. Um. This is it right here. There we go. We got it. All right. So we finished two already. All right. So we're doing good. 
don't muzzle the ox when it's treading the corn. I think that needs to be said. <laughs> Check this out. Ooh, this is going to be pepper. Spicy. Don't muzzle the ox when it's treading the corn. Um, just say that so it's easier to find. Father, I just ask that you would have your way, Daddy. You would teach us like you always do. Wow. You're the teacher and great student. So have your way. Jesus. Your name. Amen. Alright, open your um, scripture page. I hear the kingdom of heaven is like a father sowing seeds. That's the first thing I hear. The next thing I hear, no one can put his hand to the cloud. Next thing I hear, tell me about a deer. Deer? Deer? Okay. Woo! That's a lot of hours. Builders labor, labor in vain, something. The builders labor in vain. Unless, uh, there we go. Tell me, unless the Lord builds the house. What else? You sluggard? You lazy sluggard? <laughs> Oh, you lazy slugger? I'm not lazy. What was you say lazy? I'm up. I'm awake. I'm awake at one in the morning. I know you just giving me a scripture, but I'm messing around. Oh. Um, two, there's the name of two, maybe two is better than one, that's it, got it, ah, two is better than one, two can, two, I hear you, I hear you, I'm like you. Two can put ten thousand of flesh. Where two can put in a game of uh -huh, three. Okay, let's read. Oh, we're done? We're not done. I hear two things. I hear I lost it. Something with the treading. Wait, let the let the wheat grow with the tears. Let the wheat grow with the tears. Thank you. 
I've missed one. I missed one. I know I missed one. I hear you. Sickening desires. Sifting like wheat. And if you do as well, give me a chance. All right, here we go. Ooh, we got some scriptures you have to look at. All right, let's see. We're going to do Satan desires to sift you like wheat. I'm back, kind of way back, I think. Luke 22, 31. Did we start there? Okay. Oh, what he says we're starting at the former. Matthew ter Matthew thirteen twenty four. That's a bad idea. Fun is gonna make me sneeze. Okay, Matthew thirteen twenty four. Um, we have to get Palmer, right? So I don't know where we're gonna find Palmer. Matthew thirteen twenty four. Matthew 13, 24, reading verse 23 to 25. But the seed sown on good soil is the one who hears the word. Let me get King James Version so I can get farmer because I see man. I need to see farmer. I heard farmer. But the farmer sowing seed. King James version might ninety nine point nine percent of the times hear whatever you hear in the spirit you find in the King James version, and I have a Gideon's by the way, <laughs> so I don't have a King James version, which is amazing for me. All right. I still see man, but I heard farmer, like a farmer, so it's probably not my to. Okay, let's go check again. Farmer sowing seeds. This one's a farmer. Give me a farmer. Okay, here we go. Mark 4 and Luke 8. Here we go, Mark 4. Go to find it. Go to search all the scriptures until we get the one with the farmer. This is a farmer we're looking for. A second, looking, looking, looking. It just says so. It doesn't say farm. It doesn't say farm. I don't know like what. All right, let's check out Mark. I think we're gonna get it in Mark four. We might get it in Mark four. I really think we're gonna get it in Mark four. All right, here we go. Open sesame. Let's 
to get the right one, we have to find farmer sowing seeds. Farmer. I said farmer. One month. All right, here we go. It says the soa. Anybody know where the farmer is in the Bible? <laughs> it's not here. Ah, there we go. Verse 3. Behold, listen. Mark 4, 3. Listen. There went out a farmer to sow. And it came to pass, he sowed. Some fell by the wayside, and the fowls of the air came and devoured it up. And some fell on stony ground, where it had not much earth. And immediately it sprang up, because it had no depth of earth. But when the sun was up, it was scorched, because it had no roots, and it withered away. And some fell among the thorns, and the thorns grew up and took it, and it yielded no fruit. And others fell on good ground, and did yield, did yield fruit, that sprang up and increased, and brought forth some thirty, some sixty, and some a hundred. And he said unto them, Like he who has ears, let him. Okay. One moment. So then he explains exactly what it is, right? So he tells them that it is the soul and all that. But just a second. I'm still looking for something that's not found it. Like I need to find it or I can go further. Is it Luke eight five? Do we see where the farmer Farmer, I want farmer smacks. Farmer so see. Look eight five. All right, here we go. Yay, we got it. Yay. Okay, Luke eight five. So we're reading verse four to six. While a large crowd was gathering, and people were coming. To Jesus, check this out. So we're reading Luke eight, all right. So while a large crowd was gathering and people were coming to Jesus from town after town, he told them a parable. A farmer went out to sow his seed, and as he was sowing, some fell along the path where it was trampled, and birds of the air devoured it. And other seed fell on rocky ground. When it came up, the seedlings withered away because it had no moisture. So, okay. So we got the farmer. Yay. All right. So the first thing we see, uh, the farmer went out to sow his seed. If he didn't go out to sow his seed, guess what? Nothing will be planted in the ground, obviously, right? If we read a little more, Jesus explains exactly who the farmer is. And it is the word. The seed is the word of God. His father says that his word will go forth and it will not come back void. Okay? So we're reading the other one now. No one having put his hand to the plow. So, you know, we did the plowing of the field as a sermon, and that was beautifully done. 
and it, it's really like I mean it's really well done by the Holy Spirit by Jesus himself and I mean I gave it the best that I could okay Luke 962 go and check it out Luke 962 Jesus declared in verse 61 to 63 I lost my scripture page. Okay, here we go. I got it back. I do my eyes back. The light, look how they did. They just make it look scary. Idiots. I said you're an idiot. Not you, but okay, Facebook. The people who are controlling this thing like to just peep. Stop. Stop and improve. You're an idiot. Okay. Oh, nobody. I hear you, Papa. I'm sorry. Um. Luke 9:62 verse 61 to 62 still another set I'll follow you Lord but first let me bid farewell to my family so again the farmer has to go out and so he has to prepare the fields he has to plow the land he has to dig the holes he has to plant the seed, he has to fertilize the seed, he has to cover back the seed, he has to um, put the, the, what are those things they put on top of so that the sun doesn't dry out the moisture has to get. He has to put the mulch on, and I mean there's a lot of work, he has to water it, he has to not take out the weeds yet, but you know what I mean, he has to take care of it. So there's a lot of work to be done to bring in a harvest. Right? Won't you say? Some people take more work than others. Luke 9, 61, 62. Still another said, I will follow you, Lord. But first, let me bid farewell to my family. So God has called him. And like Peter, and was it Andrew? I'm not sure if it's Andrew. Don't quote me on that. But whoever Jesus called was it James uh, anyway whoever Jesus called um, to go and be a fisher of men um, they didn't think twice they were like here we go he said come I'll make you fishers of men remember when he said that going there I need a break Crying made me sniffle, and then sniffle gives me, um, fishes of me. This thing's like honey. Mm -hmm. I've been eating grapes before, so not too much. I'm going to be high for. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we're looking at Matthew 4. Verse 19. Ready? Mm -hmm. It was Andrew. Why am I doubting the words? Pop, I'm sorry. Matthew 4, verse 18. And Jesus walking by the Sea of Galilee saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea. And they were fishermen. Verse 19, he said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Here's the difference. Listen to what they did. Verse 20, they immediately left their nets and followed him. All right, so when he said, Follow me, they didn't say, Well, let me just go bid. You know, I didn't tell my mom I was going. Let me go tell her or my dad 
let me say goodbye to my brethren and my sister and you know they immediately left their nets and they followed him the bible tells us that in verse 21 going from there he saw two brothers james and the son of zeb the son of zebedee and his brother his brother in the boat with zebedee their father mending their nets he called them and what do you think they did well we're going to see right here and immediately they left the boat they and their father and followed him i hear him speaking no what is that is worthy of me i hear you Papa, going there no one who loves his father and father and brother and and sister is worthy of me, something like that, right? Matthew 10 37. Matthew 10 37. There we go. Verse 36 to 38. A man's enemies will be the members of his own household. I'm, I'm just taking that in because that's what I said before. <laughs> uh, a man's enemies will be the members of his own household. Verse 37, anyone who loves his father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Anyone who loves a son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And verse 38. And anyone who does not take up his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. <clears throat> That's a tough one to swallow, right? Check this out. A man's enemies will be the members of his own household. So while we're looking out there at strangers to hinder us, our enemies are going to be the ones closest to us, the Father says, right? And then he says, anyone who loves his father and his mother more than me. So sometimes, and many times, I'm sure a lot of people can attest to this, that you know it, it's either your granny don't agree your grandfather doesn't agree your mother doesn't agree your brother doesn't agree your sister your auntie somebody doesn't agree with you spreading the gospel um it says anyone who loves his father and his mother more than me so there are people who do things to satisfy their parents Even arranged marriages. That's what I see in the spirit. That's what he's showing me. I see our I see a wedding. Okay. Okay, so here's what he's saying. Even in arranged marriages where let's say the bride is a Hindu. Or she's a she's an idol worshiper, and they want the boy to convert to a that to marry her. But there's no. But your mother and your father desire it. He says no. He says anyone who loves his father and his mother more than me is not worthy of me. Anyone who loves his son or his daughter more than me is not worthy of himself. Where does this take us? This takes us into Abraham. Give me Isaac. Isaac. Abraham. Abraham. Verse 
we're going to look at that. So whenever, sometimes God will call us to do things that hurts like, okay, right, it hurts, but he has already said to Abraham, so I hear him, give me Isaac, take your only son and sacrifice it. Genesis 22, 2, line ones, three twos in a row. All right, so here's what he said. Abraham didn't tell Sarah. Sarah would have run him down, probably on the mountain, right? Here's what he said in verse 1. Genesis 22, verse 1. Sometime later, God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, here I am, he answered. Verse 2. Take your son. Remember we looked at the here I am? We did that in a sermon, right? Here I am. It's a it's a an obedient speech. Here I am, he answered. Take your son. Even as we say here I am, I hear him saying my spirit is present. So in that moment, the thing that I call you to do, my grace is sufficient for you. Okay, verse 2. Take your son. God said, who said? Take your son. God said, your only son Isaac, whom you love. Don't we? Take your son. God said, your only son, Isaac, remember who gave Isaac to them? God, right? Whom you love. Do we serve a jealous God? Yes, we do. Is he always testing us? Yes, he is. Whom you love and go to the land of Moriah. Offer him there as a burnt offering. On one of the mountains, I will show you. By now. What, what do you think would be going through Abraham's mind? In the, the, the mind of a normal father. He gave me, like you see the eyes again. Like, they did it again. Yeah, I'll do it. yeah it's almost there. He did it slowly. Ah, whatever. Okay. Y'all just continue to mess around. Okay. Um, what was I saying? Right. So, God told Abraham to take his only son. But God gave Abraham his only son. Now, we serve a jealous God. So, we're going to we. Oh, things are biting me. Story of my life. I'm not complaining. I'm enjoying it. <laughs> Exodus 34, 14. Listen to what Father says. Exodus 34, 14. Verse 13, 15. Rather, you must tear down their altars. Smash their sacred stones. Chop down their Asherah poles. Remember we read this yesterday, I believe, or Thursday? For you must not worship any other God. For the Lord, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous God. Verse 15. Do not make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land. For when they prostitute themselves to their gods and sacrifice to them, they will invite you and you will eat their sacrifice. Verse. All right. So God says, listen, don't, don't go into any of those things. 
because I don't want you to be defiled by the the pagans. All right, you want a pure people. So we hear him say he's a jealous God. In Genesis two two. Said it again. Uh, I lost it. Are you telling me to go into the scripture verse? I hear a muzzle the ox, so I, I'm going to type it in. All right. Just a second. Do not muzzle. All right. So in Genesis 22, 2, God is asking for Abram's son. So in verse 3, so Abram got up early next morning. No, without a question. Saddled his donkey and took along two of his servants and his son Isaac. Imagine being so connected to God that when he asks you to give up the one thing that you love or the thing that you're obsessed with because Abram was like, he got an heir to his throne now, right? So, hmm. You love him so much? Alright, here's what I want you to do. Take your only son and give him, give him to me as a burnt offering. That's what I want. Abram said, but, um, uh, uh, and he didn't tell Sarah either. He left early in the morning and went up the mountain. He took his servants. He split wood for the burnt offering and set out for the place God had designated. And we know that place is called Jehovah Jireh. All right. Now we're going a little bit more. We're going into the house of the office. Which one? The first one? Let's do Deuteronomy 25 4. You may know until I overflow. I want to run over. Deuteronomy 25 verse 4. Verse 3 to 4. He may receive no more than 40 lashes, lest your brother be beaten any more than that and be degraded in your sight. So he's giving, he's giving orders about something. In verse 4, he says, Do not bozzle an ox while it is treading the corn. A second. Deuteronomy 25. When brothers dwell together and one of them dies without a son, the widow must not marry outside the family. Her husband's brother is to take her as his wife and fulfill the duty of a brother in law for her. Okay of a brother-in-law for her as to take her as his wife to fulfill we're looking at that word because it stands up and slaps me in my face okay fulfill we're looking at when an ox is treading the corn what's that mean what does it mean to tread the corn A literal version of it. They're pulling some kind of a uh, uh, heavy, heavy plow or whatever to, you know, like that's what I think, right? Don't muzzle the ox when you're treading the corn or when they're treading out the grain, they'll eat the straw. They'll take out the straw and then they'll leave the grain. Either or. It's either he's talking about, listen, where the ex is, because when the ox, not the ex, the ox is treading the corn, 
remember they can't eat the green but you know when they they put there to eat the uh help me papa this the husk the the husk the the leaves the stalk ah uh, everything except the corn <laughs> all right we're gonna check it out i'm gonna check it out right now actually just give me a second So I think that plowing or when they're eating the hops. <clears throat> Spreading out the green. They love the, yeah, they love the, um, So I see one where they're pulling this thing and the next thing they look like they're eating the husk all right so we're gonna take it like that for now where it says it says treading out the green actually using cattle cows or buffaloes or oxen all right so it seems like they're eating the they they they, they refuse of the corn. When we look at Jesus in referral to what he's do what he's done is he's taken away sin from us, amen. He's taken sin away from us so that the pure could come. He's he's the Bible says and he says oh, ready corn. Okay, I'm not going to forget. Hey. Can you say that? See it right there. All right, I don't know why it's not responding. Anyway, so an ox treading the corn, let's say, is actually um, eating the stalk, right? Which is where. Jesus would have, what would he have done? He would have, he would have taken away sin from us, right? When he did what he did and when he's doing what he's doing, he is trying to bring up the pure from the, you know, out the world. So that's what he has his spirit doing. What was it already gave me? Just give me a second. I lost it. I'm going to get it. Um. Come on. Ah, when I come forth, I shall come forth as gold. Yes. Okay, so we're going there. he's the refining fire and we were going through these trials we're going through these things we're 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 more more or less a peculiar people to the world because we're not taking the same decisions as the world right we're taking hey where did you go what the world? Okay, there we go. Got it. Okay, so we're we are in essence like a, a peculiar people. We're strange because what the world does, we don't do, and it's the Holy Spirit that's convicting us to do what we do. So this is gonna look a little weird now, but I'm gonna say it anyway. Okay, so when the ox is treading the grain, they eat the stalk, most of it, right? They eat all the stalk, the, the bush, the the hawks. Have I seen Grandpa doing that before? I don't remember. But um, so when the ox is eating the 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 stalk, what's gonna remain is what the grain, right? And it's like if Father is passing us through the fire, 
and everything that is not of him is going to be burnt off. Everything. We're looking at the refining of the product. And who guess who's the product? We are. His fire inside of us making us into who he's called us to be and who he made us to be, which is in his image and his likeness. That's what we're, we're being made in, right? So what was the thing I heard? What was it word? Uh, when he comes forth. I'm sorry, I'm speaking loud. Job 23, 9 to 11. When he's at work, in the north, I cannot behold him. And when he turns to the south, I cannot see him. Verse 10, yet he knows the way I've taken. When he has tested me, I will come forth as gold. So you can't see God. You can't you like you don't you don't see the things that he's doing. You you know, it's either it's happening here it's happening there either way something's going to happen in life or we're going to be brought into a circumstance or a situation that we can grow from that we can learn from that we can allow his spirit to make the choices for us all right so help me here job 23 verse 9 to 11 for he's at work in the north when he's at work in the north I cannot behold him when he turns to south, I cannot see him. Verse 10, yet he knows the way I've taken. And when he's tested me, I will come forth as gold. So I don't see him, but he knows exactly what I choose. And whatever I've chosen, it's going to be good for me. Because God is going to work in it. Or whatever, whatever path that I've chosen... He's going to work with it. And it says, when he has tested me, I will come forth as gold. So that is like in Abraham's, in Abraham's path now. It's like, listen, Abraham's blessed with an heir to the throne. And could you imagine he's in his old age? And now God is saying, hey, give your son to me um, as a burnt offering. Some... How many of us would say no? How many of us would say no? If God said, hey, give me your only son. Go and burn him as a burnt offering. And you're like, how old was he? He was 90 or something, right? 100? 100? He's 100? Was he 100? Okay. Yet he knows the way I've taken and has tested me. And I will come forth as gold. Did Abraham emerge victorious? He did, didn't he? I hear him saying, do not touch the, the lap. Do not touch. Do not lay your hands on the ladder. Do not touch the Do not. Let, let's try and lay your hands on the lap. I hear a lot. No, I have heard that a lot. Genesis 22, 12. What was the other thing I was saying? Oh, Abraham was 100. So Genesis 21.5 tells us that Abraham was 100 years old when his son Isaac was born to him. 100 years old. Lord, it's a miracle dust isn't coming out of this pipe. It's really you. Is you sure? He didn't even say, you know what? Listen. Now, let's negotiate. Let's think about something else. A thousand bolts. That's good. Abraham took his son and he went. Genesis 21, 4, 6. When his son Isaac was eight days old, Abraham circumcised him. As God commanded him. Abram was a hundred years old when his son Isaac was born to him. And Sarah said, God has made me laugh. And everyone who hears of this will laugh with me. Alright. It's a strange thing, right? 
Now I hear, do not lay your hands on the lad. So we're going into Genesis 22, 12. I'm not too deep. Maybe I am just a little bit. But. Genesis 22, 11, 13. Just then the, the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven. What was he about to do? He was about to bring the dagger down. He was serious. Here I am, he replied. Abram, Abram, here I am, he replied. Every time I see here I am, that here I am immediately speaks from a spiritual perspective in that whatever you're calling me to do, I'm tapped in with you in the spirit. I know that God is present in this moment. Yeah? So, verse 11, let's read verse 10. Let's just read verse 10. Because he was talking about a dog or a knife, whatever, going to kill eyes up. All right. I don't see it anywhere. Genesis 22. I have my Bible in front of me and I'm fighting with the internet. Silly. Silly Billy. Two second. Let me. Genesis 22 10. When they arrived at the place God had designated, God chose his place, Abraham built, an, built the altar there and arranged the wood. He bounded his son Isaac and placed him on the altar on top of the wood. Verse 10. Then Abraham reached out his hand and took the knife to slaughter his son. He is tapped. Oh, sorry. He's so tapped into the spirit that he drops his knife when he hears his name. He drops his knife. He knows the voice of God. He knows that I am is present in this in this in this very hour of his life. Abe okay, verse eleven. Just then the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven. Abraham, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Do not lay a hand on the boy or do anything to him, said the angel. For now I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your only son from me. See that? Do not lay a hand on the boy. I heard lad, so maybe we should go into King James Version. Let's see if we get lad. L A D, lad. Mm. It's in the King James Version. Genesis 22:11, And the angel of the Lord called unto him out of heaven and said, Abram, Abram. And he said, Here I am. And verse 12. And he said, Lay not thine hand upon the lad. That's what I heard. Lad. Neither do thou anything unto him. For now I know that thou fearest God. And seeing thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, from me. What is this reminding us of? For God so loved the world. Amen. That he gave his only begotten son. We're going into John 3.16. Right oh, we need to get something. Right now, the drink, right now. I don't want to fall asleep. What do we got? Ooh, we got chocolate. Okay. I hear a car and I hear a door. All right, and I hear a bottle.
Just give me a second, okay? John 3.16, reading verse 15, 17. <laughs> My bad. Sorry for climbing all over the screen. Okay, John 3.16, verse 15 to 17, before and after verses. Maybe you want to read? <laughs> um... Bible Gateway. Cheers. I might be thirsty. I think it's more sugar than anything. Anyway, John 3.16, this gives me a lot of NGC. Look at my eyes, my eyes just changed. They got so wide. Alright, John 3.16. Alright, John 3.16, verse 15 to 17. I'm so done with sleep. My eyes are popping open. John 3.15. Um, John 3.15. That's what I said, right? Okay. Um. John 3.15-17. Yes, Lord. Anytime now. Thank you, Father. All right, that whosoever, okay, I, what am I reading, the, I'm going to read verse 14, because this just has one line, it doesn't make sense, um, it looks weird, John 3, 14, 17, That whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Verse 16. For God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Same thing, right? If we read in verse 14, it said, As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Remember what? Father was telling us just now about the ox treading the corn. All right, it's time for our scripture verse to get in here somehow. All right, he's remember what he was just telling us about the ox treading the corn in that don't don't stop them from doing their work. In essence, just like this, the Holy Spirit when He is doing the work in us. Keeping us out of the world, out of worldly things, out of worldly decisions and, and you know, manner. It's like, don't quench the fire of the Holy Spirit. So we're going to go with the, don't. Mm, I'm not saying it, but. Uh, all right, give me a second. It's like two in the morning, right? So if I'm looking scrappy, hey. All right, Um, what did I say? Don't. Do not quench the spirit. Why? Why should we not quench the spirit? Well, just like the ox is treading the corn, just like they're they're crushing the thing, they're eating the stalk because they like the stalk. Stalk is more filling than the grain itself. Now, for the chickens, the chickens like the corn. But um, listen, 
God says, don't muzzle the ox when it's treading the corn. Let them eat. In that, when they are separating the husk from the grain, or the, 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 the grass, or whatever you want to call it, from the grain, allow it. Because he said in his word that the Holy Spirit comes to what? Brother Ken and Sister Diana and Brother David and Marco and Israel. Brothers, brothers and sisters. What is it? What is the what is the Holy Spirit come to do? Comes to convict us of sin. Alright? We're gonna read which one are we gonna read first? Okay, we're gonna go to the we're gonna go to that one as well. The Holy Spirit convicts the world of sin. That's why more than often when you speak truth to some people, they get angry. John sixteen eight and the truth, I mean the word, all right? word is truth and then he says sanctify us by your truth because your word is truth all right we're looking at john 16 verse 8 yes papa here we go john 16 verse verse 7 but i tell you the truth that's what we were talking about, the truth. It is for your benefit that I am going away. Unless I go away, the advocate or the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, verse 8, he will convict. He will what? So it's not my words. The Holy Spirit comes to what? To convict the world in regard to to sin and righteousness and judgment. So he does a couple things. What does he do? He convicts, he comforts, he guides, he teaches. But look how many things he convicts of. It says in regard to sin, that is the transgression of the law, righteousness, what is pleasing unto God, and judgment. Where are you going to get judged for? All right. And it says in verse 9, in regard to sin, because they do not believe in me. So why is that conviction going to come? Because they don't believe in him. Jesus said they don't receive the truth because the love of the truth is not in them. It's not good news, but it is what it is, right? Um, he goes on further. Well, we're, we're going to go now, don't quench the Spirit, because the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of God, and if you, you stop Him from doing His work, then the truth doesn't get sifted. And does God want us to be sifted from the rubbish? Yes, He does. 1 Thessalonians 5, 19, verse 18 to 20, give thanks in every circumstance. For this is God's will for you in Christ. Here's what he says in Christ Jesus. Verse 19. Do not extinguish the spirit. I heard quench. We're going to go into the King James Version just now. Do not treat prophecies with contempt. So we're going into King James Version, verse 19 of Second Te um, 1 Thessalonians 5. there. <laughs> verse First Thessalonians 5 verse 18. In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you and me. And it says, verse 19, quench not the Spirit. You see, if a fire is burning, that's what I heard in the Spirit, quench. Because when a fire is burning, 
and you got to out it down and you got to lower it down it's blazing quench the flames turn it down a notch the words that are being spoken are too much to bear I'm going there Matthew, no, just a second. I'm looking. I hear him saying the words you cannot hear. I hear yet, or something like that. The words you cannot receive. Something like that, we're gonna find it. All right, here we go. John sixteen twelve. Something is going in my needle and it's ignorant to the earth eating the crap on checking me. John sixteen twelve verse eleven. How convenient, wherever you came from, how do I use this? Lift it up and I'll pull it aside. I don't know. Okay, ow. John 16, verse 12. So we're reading verse 11 to 13. All right, and here's what he says. In regard to judgment, because the prince of this world has been condemned. We got to read verse 10 to get the whole thing. That's a part of a, a sentence that I don't understand. John 16, 11. Oh, this is when he's going to the Father. All right, here we go. We're looking at John 16, verse 9. We're going a little bit further. Okay, we're not going further. We have to read what we heard. Forget that. It's like a trap. I keep going back further. John 16, what would I see initially? 11, right? What was the thing? Oh, you cannot be able to hear it. All right. So in John 16, 11, it said, And in regard to judgment, because the prince of this world has been condemned. Who's the prince of this world? Satan. And verse 12, he's not a prince in heaven, but anyway. You know, he's still a fallen angel. God didn't make it. He didn't make it fallen, but he chose to be fallen. Verse 12, I still have much to tell you, but you cannot yet be yet to hear it. That's like right. Verse 13, however, when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak on his own, but he will speak what he hears, and he will declare to you what is to come. So sometimes we are we're we're in a situation. I'm always in this thing. Okay, this morning I was in and somebody was arguing down with me to the last about adultery and how it's okay to get married a third time and I okay no by grace and all this and I'm like Father's just saying no adulterer, no fornicating and no drunkard and no liar are gonna enter into the kingdom of heaven. So that's what I keep hearing every time this person's talking. I'm like, we had a big argument because of it, right? Because that's what the Father says. He says, the Spirit of Truth comes. He will what? He will guide you into all truth. He will not speak of his own, but what he hears. And he will declare to you what is to come. So that, that is in essence with prophecy and 
revelations and all of that. Very, very important because remember, sometimes Jesus will reveal himself to us. You ever had, today I had one of those moments where you have deja vu, where you're like, you've been there before. I've never seen that house before except in the spirit. And I think it might have been in 2015 that I saw, I had a vision of where I went today. And um, strange enough, that's when, yeah, that's when I was given a prophecy as well. That happened to be very true. So today I was having like a, you know, that whole moment. And it was just me unraveling my charger and going, okay, where can I plug this? And then the person spoke and said something. And I'm like, I, sp I froze, right? Now, when God is in something, he's always going to give you. He's, he's always going to speak. He's always going to lead. That is his, that is what he does best. He is Father. So, of course, he wants you to go on the right path. So, he leads and he teaches and he guides and he convicts and he, he lights and he gives you that conviction, right? He, he makes it very, very known to you. He says, when the spirit of truth comes. He will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak on his own, but he will speak of what he hears, and he will declare to you what is to come. So it's a very, very important rule that the rule that the Spirit of God does, because remember, he's convicting of sin, righteousness, and judgment. And we think sin is a transgression of the law, righteousness, what? The fine linen are the righteous acts of the saints, so the saints have to act in righteousness of Christ, okay? Not just take the righteousness, yes, by the blood, hallelujah, and go back into sin. And then, of course, judgment. Every deed is going to be built into judgment. And God says, don't you know that you will judge angels? All right, so, um, all right, how do we get here again? I'm going back. <laughs> beep, beep. I'm reversing now. All right. So he said, I have much to tell you, but you can't be able to hear it yet. Why not? Because the spirit isn't given. And you're not going to understand. And spiritual things are spiritually discerned. Amen. So then he tells us in 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 19 not to quench the spirit because just like how the ox is treading the corn basically separating basically dividing for us truth from lie what's good and what's bad what's going to heaven and what's going to hell all these things first thessalonians 5 verse 19 tells us Quench not the spirit. Don't quench the spirit. Don't shut up the spirit. When the spirit begins to minister to you, or when it begins to minister to someone, don't say, you know, this thing is too hard for us to receive right now. Or, you know, when they, you know, they like to say it. Or, um, you know, don't tell us such things because we can't obey to hear it. That is where you speak the truth to people and they get very angry with us, right? So he says, don't quench the spirit. And that's what he did to me on street preaching. And that's why God told me, hey, out of there. Because there, Jesus is speaking through me and they don't want to hear it because it's offending. Okay? So again, it says in verse 20, despise not prophecies. So he kind of lines up these two in that he says he'll tell you of the things to come and then in first thessalonians he says don't despise the prophecies as well because that's the way the spirit is speaking to you he's bringing you into conviction that he is speaking through this vessel okay all right so we're going deeper let's go deeper we're going into john 3 14 where we looked at moses lifting up the serpent 
which is just like when sin was separated from us and placed on Christ, amen, because sin separated us from God, and God didn't want that anymore, so he took it on himself and did away with it. And it says, when Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so the Son of Man must be lifted up. That's like the ox treading the corn as well, separating. Okay, and it says, verse 15, whoever believe in him should not perish, but have eternal life. All right, because that's what he came to bring. And of course, it is just like the good grain, the good grain, the good things. You, you no longer see sin as something desirable, but something detestable. That's another thing we argued for. I want no part in adultery. None. And purposely, now that I know what it is, oh, you'll never catch me alive. All right, so here's what he says. He says, just like that, it's like if you were taking the, the chaff, can I say chaff? Or can I see um, <laughs> bush, <laughs> um, the stalk, the leaves, what do you call it when you take the leaves or the stalk off the corn and you just have the grain, the good part? God says that gather the grain or the wheat into my barn and burn the chaff. Burn it. It's garbage. He doesn't want garbage. All right? Some of our minds need to be empty of garbage. Um, here's what he says. So Jesus, when he did that separation, in essence, in the spiritual sense, he's separating the wheat from the tears. Not physically yet, but spiritually he's separating. All right? So remember, spiritually things are spiritually discerned. Now in Genesis 22, when Abraham listened to God, um... How did we get to Abraham again? Oh, give me your only son. There we go. Don't interrupt the process. If I hear you, Papa. Don't interrupt the process. So it mightn't be what you like. It mightn't be what you think should have happened. It mightn't be what Sarah wanted. But listen. Abraham said it's what God wants, and what God wants, I want, however much it's going to hurt. Because Abraham believed God, and he believed that, hey, if he, okay, look at this, we were made from ashes, from dust. So if Isaac burnt to ashes, what if God could just form him back and bring him back to life? Abraham left nothing to second guess. He knew God is able to do all things, all right? So this calling of Abraham to give Isaac, um, give up Isaac was a test, and a test that all of us must go through. Because you remember when he was telling us that he he works in the north and he works in the in the south or something like that, and um, he knows the path that we take, and what was it again? When I come forth, when he's tested me, and I come forth, I shall come forth as gold. Yeah. Okay. We're going into Job 23. I hope I got it right. Yeah, I got most of it right. And then he says, he said in verse, okay, let's read it. Job 23, verse 9 to 11. When he's at work in the north. I cannot see him. And when he turns to south, I can't see him. I can't behold him. Verse 10. Yet he knows the way I've taken. Of course he does. He's God. His eyes are everywhere. And when he's tested me. So whichever path we take, we're going to be tested. He says, when he's tested me, I will come forth as gold. In other words, it might be hot right now. You're in the hot seat. You're in the fire. But when we come through the fire, the Spirit of God 
is able to burn out the impurities from us, just like when um, silver is heated in the earth seven times, yes, Father. And his word is that pure. What does God want us to be? Like him in his image and his likeness. And he is the what? The living word. So what does he want us to be? Pure. It, doesn't he say somewhere in his word, be perfect as I am perfect, be holy as I am holy? Amen? All right, we're going to look further and we're going to go deeper. Um, now we're in the ox treading the corn. <laughs> That's the next one. Oh. See how deep we're going? We're going deep. I like this. I don't like it's fun. It's making it seem fun. All right, here we go. So in Deuteronomy 5, 25, 6, he gives us a little insight. And he says in verse 5, when brothers dwell together and one of them dies without a son, he's childless. But now that brother has a wife and a son. And now they don't have a father. What does God want us to do? It says what? It said brothers. When brothers dwell together. It says her husband's brother is to take her as his wife and fulfill the duty of a brother-in-law for her. Verse 6. The first son she bears will carry on the name of the dead brother. So that his name will not be blotted out from Israel. He's talking about brethren in the body of Christ or in, in Israel, in the camps of Israel. Verse 7, but the man does not, but if the man does not want to marry his brother's widow, she is to go to the elders at the city gate and say, my husband's brother refuses to preserve his brother's name in Israel. He's not willing to perform the duty of a brother-in-law to me. He's willing to what? He's unwilling to what? Preserve. Something's being preserved. It's an ongoing process. Amen? It's, if it's being preserved, it's being kept. And it's an ongoing process. Now, isn't that what Jesus is doing with us? He's keeping us. He's keeping us in the ways of his spirit so that at his coming, we know what's going to happen, right? All right, we're checking out Exodus 34, 14, where we heard the God we serve is a jealous God. Rather, you must tear down the altars and smash their sacred stones and chop down their Asherah poles. But you must not worship any other God. The Lord, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous God. Verse 15, do not make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land. For when they prostitute themselves to their gods and sacrifice to them, they will invite you and you'll eat from their sacrifices. God doesn't want you eating from the sacrifices of them. He wants you to keep on the fire. Now, um, we looked at, okay, we looked at nothing holding us back in Matthew 10. Um, 36 to 38, it says a man's enemies will be the members of his own household. Verse 37, anyone who loves his father, his mother, more than me, is not worthy of me. Anyone who loves his son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And anyone who does not take up his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. It makes it plain as day. You can have nothing in front of God. Nothing. He says, take up the truth and walk with it. Take up the cross and walk with it. That is your cross. The cross is the truth of God's word. In Matthew 4.19, he showed us where he called the brothers and immediately they left. They didn't say, well, let me go and bury my father first and let me go and say goodbye and wish them farewell and all that. He showed us the farmer where he started the work. And some went on good seed and bad, bad on um, good ground and bad ground. What's up this one? Right there. He says Satan desires to sift you like wheat. Now God wants to keep the sin away from you, but Satan 
is sifting through every itsy bitsy grain to find some sin. And that's where we must claim the blood of Jesus as the all powerful, the atoning sacrifice for all sin. Amen. Satan desires to, to tempt you, he desires to um, afflict you, he desires to make you suffer until you mess up the plans that God has for your life. In Luke 22 31, he fought. Oof, one ticket. Luke 22 31. Verse 30 to 32. And he says in verse 30, I can't even see the first verse. Come on. The internet is super fast. Wow. I can't believe it. Super fast. Wow. Here we go. Luke. 22 30 so you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on thrones judging the 12 tribes of israel what did he just say there we're going to read verse 29 in a little bit see what he was talking about way he was referring to but listen to what he tells simon Simon, Simon, Satan has asked us if each of you like wheat, because they are the followers of Jesus. He really wants to see if they are, or if he can get some soul, you know how the devil is, or if he can get a soul. But I've prayed for you, Simon. Simon, Simon, see, Satan has decided to sift each of you like wheat. He wants to see the chaff. But I've prayed for you, Simon, that your feet will not fail. And when you've turned back, strengthen. And strength you when you've turned back, strengthen your brothers. What does that mean? He already knew that what? He would he would deny him. Alright? He already knew that Peter would deny him. So he said, when you when you do that thing that I know you're going to do, and I, I know you're going to do it because Satan desires to sift you like wheat. He will use the opportune time to mess you up. And remember when Simon denied Jesus? That was really sad. Um, the Bible tells us that, um, how does he say it? He says, Simon. Um, you're gonna do the Lord said, Peter, you're gonna get, deny me before the cock crows three times, right? The rooster crows three times, and he did. And he said, So, after he says, After come back and strengthen your brothers, you see where he says that? He says, Come back and strengthen your brothers, give them hope when you have dealt with the guilt of what you've done. That your feet won't fail. You won't give up on me even though you deny me. You won't be too ashamed. You'll come back. And when you've turned back, which means he turned away. See that? When you've turned back, which means Peter turned away from Jesus. He said, strengthen your brother. Father is so loving. He amazes me. And he said, let the wheat grow with the tears because why? They're both very, very similar. They're very, very alike. If you saw a picture of a wheat and tear, it's almost the same thing. It looks really, really alike. He says, let the wheat and the tear grow together. Why? Well, second. Ugh. All right. 
So remember when we spoke about the work that the farmer has to do in the very beginning? And some of that is uprooted the wheat, but not yet. The weed has to be uprooted. But if the plants are tender, then you can do things in such a way that if you go and you take all of it out, you know, like you take a big and you just rip it out. You're gonna rip out the shoot of the wheat, the wheat itself, right? The wheat. The wheat, right? The wheat is what I meant to say. Wheat! Okay. So when you don't want to do that, he says don't do don't do that. Let it grow. Let it grow. Because he said in Matthew 13, verse um, 25. Or 24, let's read it. Another parable he put forth to them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. Verse 25, But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tears among the wheat and went his way. When he relaxed a little bit, when he went back into the world a little bit, the enemy tried to what? Sift him like wheat. Check what he did. So he planted what? Tears among the wheat. All right, check this. So he's no longer pure wheat. He has tears among them. And when the grain had sprouted and produced a crop, see that? So now you can't tell what is a tear and what is a wheat because they're both appearing. But how can you tell? Be not tears only, but doers also. One of them is going to be our crop, right? And that's the time of the harvest. There we go. So in verse 26, but when the grain had sprouted and produced a crop, when the tears also appeared, then the tears also appeared. So the servants of the owner came and said to him, Sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have tears? And he said to them, An enemy has done this. And the servant says, Do you want us to go and gather them up, pluck them out? But he said, no, at least while you gather up the tears, you also uproot the wheat with them. Let both, verse 30, let both grow until the harvest. I hear him saying something. You ever sow a plant, like if you graft a plant, or not graft a plant, if you mix a plant, like, um, I've done this before, you know, like, um, I've done some crazy, crazy things with plants, like pepper with lettuce, I think. The thing came out spicy, okay? <laughs> the, the lettuce soaked up the pepper plant. The pepper plant, I don't know, somehow, they, they, they mix. Like, um, oh, there's so many examples. There are plants that cross... They cross each other and they grow. And if the wheat and the tears are planted together, well, remember, he sowed good good seed. The enemy sowed the tears. So when the tears are growing up now, are they being nourished by the root? Well, the root is sustaining. The, they have this, this thing. I hear him saying something about the root. And I hear him also saying, I'm father, I send rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. That's what he means as well. In that, the ground is like the foundation, or the ground, not the foundation. The ground is like the Father. The ground is like the provision that the Father gives. And both are growing. And the only time we're going to see what is a tear and what is a wheat is at harvest. Because we're going to see one bring a crop and the other try to choke the plant. That's something like the great battle of Armageddon where father comes and he deals with it, you know? Anyway, so he said, verse 30, let them both grow together until the harvest. At the time of the harvest, I will say to the reapers, the reapers, what would he say? First, gather the tears and bind them in bundles to break them 
to burn them. That is hellfire. And but gather the wheat into my barn. That is the rapture. All right. Now the Bible says, how did we get? I didn't even know we got to this part. Where two come touching an agreement, it shall be done. All right. Matthew 18, 19. Come on. I'm almost there. Come on. Fine, I'm going in my Bible. But God's going to work out. It's so weird. Every time I pick up the Bible, it works. See? Fill me up. Matthew 8. Matthew 